you may or may not be very familiar with the work of the Royal School of Church Music. We are an educational charity whose mission is to develop, support and nurture church musicians and to encourage the church to make the best use of music in worship. The RSCM was founded back in 1927 by Sir Sidney Nicholson and he could little have imagined the world of 2020 where for a time worship could only happen online and where the practical arrangements required to enable music making of any sort could be quite so challenging. But his passion for harnessing the power of music in worship and for encouraging all those that are responsible for it remains our passion today. We're glad to be able to respond proactively to the challenges the current circumstances present. The climate around us show our work and resources needed more than ever. We've had to adapt, change our offerings and show others how they must do that too, and we're working as best we can to build on our heritage, enabling new kinds of growth and development for the future. There is still much to celebrate, and the RSCM remains a stable presence alongside all those who do so much to sustain music and worship. In particular, we work to equip churches, their local communities, and their clergy, musicians and singers with practical resources and advice. Choral music remains vitally important to us, but we are not just for choirs. We want to help make churches use the best of their resources in a wide range of musical styles. The RSCM is an independent charity. We don't get money from the government or the church, but we work closely alongside the church and continue to do our utmost to help shape its future. We are thankful for all our members and supporters who enable us to keep doing this. You can join them, perhaps by becoming a member yourself, or donating, or by giving your support in a more practical way. Details of all these things are on our website, rscm.org.uk. We know that so many people value our work, but that news of what we can offer to others in support needs to be spread wider. Please help us by sharing in that task. Thank you. Well, good afternoon and welcome to this, the fifth in the series of lunchtime lectures, which is just one of the many new initiatives the RSCM is currently undertaking as part of our work to support church music and church musicians. Some of you may have joined in one of our big online services this year, and I encourage you all to take part in tomorrow's big Christmas carol service, which we are organising with the Churches Conservation Trust. It is going to be a really exciting service with lots of famous readers and will be introduced by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. That's tomorrow at 6pm and you can find more details on the RSCM website. And it's still not too, too late to download the music for it. Now today's lecture is given by Dr John Henderson. John is the RSCM's uh, honorary librarian and author of a number of books on the history of the RSCM as well as the award-winning directory of organ composers. The lecture will last approximately 40 minutes. Now do use the chat feed to tell us where you are joining from and ask any questions. If you are watching this on Facebook you can use the comments to send us your questions and say where you're uh, where you're listening from. I'll keep an eye on those and put some of them to John in the questions and answers session. So if you think of anything that you'd like to ask then uh, during the lecture then just put it in the chat or the comments and we'd love to hear from you. At the end of the lecture I'll also be giving out this week's code for any non-RSCM members who want to take advantage of our offer to become an individual member of the RSCM for a year at a special 10% discount. This code will only last until 5 p.m. next Thursday. And now here is a short anthem to introduce John Henderson's talk about Victorian church music, an era that has been forgotten.
Hello, and a happy Advent to you all. Uh, that was Prevent Us, O Lord, in All Our Doings by Sir Herbert Brewer, published in 1900 and so just Victorian as the Queen died in 1901. On reflection, this talk should really have been titled Late Victorian and Edwardian Church Music Composers because nearly all of the composers we recently researched for our uh, recent book, which I will unashamed, unashamedly plug by the end of this talk, were born and started work during the Victorian era, uh, but often their later and more mature works really came during Edwardian times. The much earlier Victorian composers, such as Sir John Goss, will have to wait until another day, or maybe another book. Before focusing on individual composers, I'd like to talk briefly about some of the dramatic developments in both Christian worship and in musical education that took place during the Victorian era. For these led to an explosion of creativity from the formerly trained musicians who wrote music for the burgeoning number of church choirs and organists and Sunday schools, a musical renaissance now largely forgotten. Many know that it happened, but can hardly comprehend the size of it. I suppose it was the 19th century equivalent of today's explosion of evangelical worship music. But despite the fact that they did not have the electronic publishing and communications that are available to us now, music publishing and music sales in Victorian times were staggeringly larger than today, at least in the United Kingdom and the USA. There were so many musical journals available, several published weekly, but mostly monthly. Uh, these include Musical Times, The Musical Standard, The Musical World, Musical News, Musical Opinion, Monthly Musical Record, Organist and Choir Master, and the Nonconformist Musical Journal and such like. And all of these were filled with advertisements. Here is an example. This 1891 issue of Musical Opinion had 34 pages of advertisements like this, crammed in, not only for music, of course, but for music teachers, pianos, harmoniums, organs, and indeed all manner of musical instruments. Within the Church of England, the Oxford movement with its Tractarianism and the Cambridge Camden Society triggered significant new approaches to liturgy. There was a boom in the restoration, enlargement and reconfiguring of church buildings, resulting in the birth of many choirs, thousands of new organs being built, and much of this funded by benefactors, whose wealth had been created during the still ongoing Industrial Revolution. The large workforce based in the Midlands and the north of England required churches and chapels to be built for their spiritual welfare. welfare together, of course, with enough musicians and publications uh, for music and worship. Now, to provide enough professional musicians at all levels, both for church and for secular activities, required a concurrent revolution in musical education. Until then, the musical education of professional musicians was largely undertaken by universities or by cathedral or parish church organists. During the 19th century, however, we see the foundation and rise of the great colleges of music in London, the Royal Academy, the Royal College, Trinity College, London College of Music, Victoria College, the Guildhall, Goldsmiths, Goldsmiths, as well as numerous small private conservatories. Provincial, Welsh and Scottish cities also founded very significant music colleges. Trinity College in London was especially notable because of its extensive nationwide and later worldwide network of examinations and diplomas, these for both amateurs and for professionals. Domestic music making was revolutionised by the availability of relatively inexpensive instruments, especially pianos. And with this increase, many graduates of the music colleges became private professors, advertised widely in local papers. In fact, there were really too many of these teachers for the demand, and musicians featured very highly in the published lists of bankruptcies. The teaching of music and instruments in schools was seen at that time as an integral part of education, so that many music graduates were able to survive financially 
through school teaching positions. In the free churches, and especially within the Sunday school movement, there was an increasing demand for children's music, and especially so after 1870, when the Elementary Education Act introduced the national framework for the state education of primary school children in the three R's. This left Sunday schools to concentrate more on artistic and spiritual matters. The founding of the great regular music festivals around the country, featuring enormous choirs and large orchestras to accompany them, led to the commissioning of many oratorios and cantatas. These festivals, such as Norwich, Bristol, Birmingham and the famous Three Choirs Festival, often featured music by local composers, especially the local cathedral organists, who were, were usually the principal top dog musicians in each city. The music that we would today consider as the great music of the past, the orchestral and choral music from the great composers of the Baroque and classical eras, was mainly brought to local people by transcriptions for organ performed in organ recitals, which were effectively the classic FM of that time. The town hall organ recital uh, was became very well established and during the 45 years between 1834 and 1889, at least 58 city and town halls had been built containing organs. These not only for the accompaniment of choral performances, but also for giving solo recitals. Yes, there were orchestras performing Beethoven, Mozart, and not only the big professional orchestras in the major cities, but also numerous amateur and semi-professional orchestras in small towns, such as Barnstable or Eastbourne. Due to their size, orchestras were expensive to maintain, and ticket prices were consequently high, so that the economics of an organ recital with just one performer and often a free venue ensured that organ recitals flourished. In some larger venues, such as the Crystal Palace, regular orchestral concerts were a feature of life, not just for the well-off, but as a deliberate effort was made to encourage the working classes to attend with some minimal ticket prices and programmes featuring a more populist repertoire. The Victorian elite saw it as their duty to encourage education of the masses. And so working men's institutes sprung up everywhere where working classes could read newspapers, learn different skills and be educated in the arts and music. Amateur singing in both male voice choirs and mixed choirs was very widespread to a level that is really hard to envisage now. Doesn't also forget that there was a stream of popular music in Victorian times parallel to the church, whereby operetta transformed into musical burlesque in theatres all over the country, and this later further transformed into Edwardian musical comedy, and of course popular song was in evidence everywhere at all times. When we look back at the church music in, in this time, we can see that there were differing views and very strongly held opinions about the style of music suitable for worship. On the one hand, there were the traditionalists who wanted solemn and dignified music. And then there were those who sought to modernize the music in both mood and tempo and to use new melodic and harmonic idioms. So really nothing has very much changed, has it? In addition, there were musicians rediscovering the music of older composers such as Palestrina and the English Tudor School. And there were also those rediscovering plain song. The clergy of the churches, and certainly within the Anglican churches and cathedrals, rapidly became polarized between those who were in favor of liturgy and ritual, the Anglo-Catholic end of the spectrum, and those who felt that the Book of Common Prayer was completely inviolable. There were attempts to remove priests who strayed from the Book of Common Prayer, and one such place was St Andrew's Well Street in London, so very famous for its music that tickets had to be issued to attend services in a church seating 1,200. The story goes that the vicar upset his congregation with new liturgical practices, to such an extent that the Archbishop of Canterbury became involved. He also disapproved of the changes, 
but acknowledged that the monetary cost of taking to court the many priests who were making these changes, because it wasn't just at Well Street, it was widespread, would cost the church thousands of pounds and could not be justified. Often bishops were powerless when congregations complained about dreadful new practices. And among the crimes committed at Well Street were decorating the altar with candles and flowers, having processions and a midnight service on Christmas Eve. But worse still, an expensive choir had been established. The sermon is preached in a surplus and that neither the colic nor the Lord's Prayer are used before the sermon. The only invocation being in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Well, much of this seems pretty standard practice in the C of E today, but back then it was regarded as popery. So that in that same year at St Andrews, to quote, the choir and clergy as they processed into the church were treated with violence by Protestants who allegedly let small birds dressed like cardinals fly round the building. Many priests, however, encouraged increasingly ambitious music, partly perhaps so that large congregations would be attracted to their churches by the music. These congregations would then fall under the spell of their charismatic preaching and hopefully contribute to the offertory plate. Cathedral music was in a pretty low ebb in the early 19th century. But as a generation of new enthusiastic organists came along and the training of boys' voices was taken more seriously and money was injected into the music budgets, things started to look up. Organists were seeking larger instruments that were suitable not only for the liturgy, but also for accompanying choral societies and festivals. And they wanted organs that were more orchestral in style for the new kind of repertoire and the transcriptions that were in evidence. Notable amongst these was a clutch of organists in the three choirs area, Gloucester, Hereford and Worcester. Hugh Blair, Hugh Herbert Brewer, George Sinclair, Ivor Atkins, C.H. Lloyd, and living between them all in the county of Gloucestershire was Basil Harwood. Now, many of you will know the evening canticles, Brewer in D and Harwood in A flat and Blair in B minor. Although regarding the Blair, while most of us actually, what most of us actually sing now is really Ivor Atkins in B minor and not Blair's original, but that's another story. Even those who know the names of Blair, Brewer, Harwood and Lloyd may not realize that they composed many canticle settings and communion settings. Blair composed eight evening services and six communions. Brewer, seven evening and one communion. Basil Harwood composed, composed four evening canticles and seven of the communion, and Lloyd gave us six evening and three communions. Now, I would be the first to admit that I have not examined all 42 of these service settings, but several are certainly worthy of rediscovery, notably Harwood in E minor and Brewer in E flat evening services and Blair in E flat communion. The music for these three services can be found on the CD uh, bundled with our book. All of the music we provide on this CD is out of copyright and free to use in the UK. Though I would have to admit that some of these services were actually composed after Queen Victoria's death, so were really Edwardian. It is notable that the organ accompaniments provided by Blair and Harwood in many of their works are truly independent of the voices and of a difficulty level that might partly explain why their settings fell into disuse in parish churches. Now, Sir Frederick Bridge was organist of Westminster Abbey from 1875 to 1918, when he gave way to a young Sidney Nicholson, founder of the RSCM. Bridge's output was considerable, 42 anthems, 33 carols, 24 hymn editions and 44 hymn tunes. And he was well known throughout the country, not just because of his status at Westminster Abbey, but because he was an amiable and humorous character, a great raconteur who was loved everywhere and in great demand, both as a speaker and recitalist. As a result, he received many commissions and his 15 cantatas were all composed for various festivals. In the end, his most popular pieces proved to be his secular humorous part songs, 
not just the famous Goslings, which many of you will know, but other part songs, both for male and mixed voice choirs. All of Bridges' music was technically excellent. He was, after all, the author of major textbooks on musical theory. But apart from the humorous pieces, they exhibit little creativity and seem rather facile. One notable exception, which I will mention here, although it's not choral, it's his organ sonata of 1885. Bridge was the joint editor of the Organ Works of J.S. Bach series for Novello, and he was well known as a recitalist. But he himself composed very little for the instrument. This sonata in D minor is, dare I say it, a masterpiece. The outer movements are vigorous and slightly Germanic in style, the beautiful slow movement is notated very precisely with registration, manual changes and expression markings, but it does need three manuals and a great attention to detail. The music of this whole sonata and a superb recording of this movement by David Lamb can be found on our CD. Notable amongst the output of Bridges' contemporaries is the significant amount of work they all put into writing cantatas and oratorios for the great music festivals. Often these works were only performed two or three times, partly because the forces required were large and very expensive. Many of these works also proved to be mediocre. Elgar's Dream of Gerontius, most are not. But they cannot all be so bad as to warrant total extinction. And actually quite often individual choruses uh, were, from them were issued as successful st standalone anthems. However, the revival of many of these cantatas is greatly hindered by the somewhat dated language of the poetry and texts. Indeed, some of Elgar's works have this inbuilt disadvantage. Now, one name from the past that makes many people either smile or groan is that of Caleb Simper, a completely self-taught musician. His 12 books of 17 voluntaries, which are easy two-stave two pieces for amateur organists, have never been out of print or use for over 100 years. A record shared by few, apart from Stainer and his crucifixion. Simper was born in Worcester, and the professional music scene in Worcester in the latter half of the century was highly significant, both nationally as well as locally. And the amateur Simper Amateur Simper had virtually no interaction with any of it. He did, however, start publishing anthems with Weeks in London in 1882 at the age of 26. And he was also successful in several competitions for writing hymn tunes. One of his best known works was the Easter anthem, King of Kings. And the copy we have in the RSCM library is marked 185,000. And this same copy, which was actually printed in 1916, claims on the back that over 5 million copies of music by Simper had already been sold worldwide and that he was sung throughout the civilized world. Such advertising might suggest a man with a large ego, but by all accounts, he was modest and a much liked person of retiring disposition. The hubris was entirely that of his publisher. We'll now hear part of King of Kings, one of several modern performances to be found on YouTube. This one is by the Thlam Poussaint Choral Society, based near Caparthen, directed by Gwyn Nicholas with Alan Fuster at the organ.
Well, I think that's probably enough of that. Um, again, some of you will groan and some will smile at hearing music like this. It's so very different to the more subtle offerings from some of the cathedral organists of the time. But you can see why it was so popular with amateur musicians. Altogether, we found 228 anthems by Simper, four cantatas, many settings of the liturgy, and dozens of carols. It's of interest to note that on his death, Simper was a very wealthy man. Excepting those composers like Basil Harwood and Sir Hubert Parry, who had inherited wealth, Simper proved to be one of the most sex successful musicians of his time from the business point of view. Now, John Henry Maunder is still known today for his passion cantata, Olivet to Calvary. Maunder was a civil servant working in the Comptroller General's Department at the Inland Revenue Headquarters in London. Unlike many amateur composers, he did actually receive a formal musical education at the Royal Academy, possibly making his music more technically accomplished than some of his contemporaries. In 1881, he was appointed honorary conductor of the Civil Service Vocal Union, a 60-strong male voice choir which he directed for 21 years. For the churches where he was organist in Forest Hill and Blackheath, he regularly composed anthems for harvest festival services. So that of his 20 published anthems, half are for harvest festivals. The most popular of these was Sing to the Lord of Harvest, dated 1893, which achieved some considerable success and has even been reissued in the recent 2017 anthology, The Oxford Book of Easy Flexible Anthems. More important are Maunder's cantatas, the first of which was Penitence, Pardon and Peace, a short Lenten cantata, followed by Olivet to Calvary, which was an instant hit. In the 10 days after its first performance in London in March 1904, it was performed numerous times in both the UK and in America. A remarkable achievement for a brand new piece of music that had only first been announced two months earlier in the January issue of the Musical Times as will be published shortly. This was shrewd advertising on the part of Novello as by this time, 15 years after the publication of Stainer's Crucifixion, Many churches were looking for Holy Week alternatives to the Stainer. Olivet has received a mixed press over the years, ranging from superlative praise to downright insults. We must each make our, up our own mind, but judging by the number of performances in recent years, the work may be having a slight revival. Like the crucifixion, Olivet exhibits that same deeply felt heart on sleeve religiosity, which some admire and others deride. If you like the Stainer, you will probably also like Maunder. A few years later, he published Bethlehem, his last major work, and frankly, almost as good as Olivet and very rarely heard. It's in three parts, the shepherd's gifts, the king's gifts and our gift. We'll now play a clip of one of the choruses from Bethlehem. This is Glory to God, and it's sung by the vocal ensemble Credo of Dordrecht in Holland.
That I have played you two clips of music by Semper and Maunder is not to suggest that these are the legacy of Victorian period. But their style of music is held by some to be the norm for that area. I'm unable to play you really good church music or major choral works by Victorian composers because there are no recordings of music by the better composers. This is partly why the recorded examples on the CD with our book are all of organ music. These are relatively easy to provide. All you need is suitable organ, a good organist and a page of dots. And there is a recording costing virtually nothing. My particular interest has always been organ music, and I have discovered much from the 19th century that has given pleasure to my, both to myself and I hope to my congregation. The main problem is actually finding the printed Victorian scores. I've been collecting these since my student days in Cambridge, and throughout this 50 year journey, I have made a positive effort to acquire out of print music whenever I come across it. Like the organ music of today, and similar to the organ music in Germany from 1850 to the First World War, there were basically three main strands of organ music. There is the Gebrauch music, utilitarian music for service use, not intended to be deeply felt or a great gift to posterity. Often this music was, and is indeed still today, commissioned by publishers as a business venture to fill a need. The second strand of organ music is that of much lighter music, mainly intended for concert use or entertainment, although much of it was also used in church right through into Edwardian times. The third strand of organ music is the organ equivalent of leader, the art song as opposed to the popular song, art organ music as opposed to entertainment music. And this music was usually composed either as a commission or as a spontaneous outpouring of creativity from the composer, perhaps at times of personal life events such as bereavement, love, marriage. More often though, it was just part of their deep Christian faith. And the best music of the Victorian Edwardian time era is often found within this last strand. I actually think today we would probably say there is a fourth strand of organ music, music that stretches the limits of organ composition, of organ technology and of organ performance, sometimes using multimedia and electronics, the avant-garde, vital for progress, but sadly often not greatly appreciated by congregations. Having explored the organ music of this time by these composers you'll see on the screen here, I am amazed that so much magnificent music has been forgotten. And this is mainly because when the music fell out of favour in the mid and late 20th century, the physical copies of music went out of print. And out of print is the death knell for any music. Some small enthusiastic independent publishers today, such as Adrian Self at Animus and David Patrick at Fitz Fitzjohn, have republished a few pieces. But with modern technology, which now enables us to scan and distribute old music easily, it allows seemingly lost music to be shared widely. Most of you will be familiar with CPDL and IMSLP as online sources of free music but we all use these at a cost because we reduce income for today's music publishers so forcing up the price of newly published music for our book we did not include some really famous pieces of public domain music such as brewer and d canticles or brewer's wonderful march heroic for organ because these are still in print and available to purchase from music shops and online retailers so back to the basic question underlying the talk, is any of this church music worthy of revival or does it have no place today? Of course, I strongly believe the answer is yes. Don't be dismissive of the entire period because of one or two really dreadful pieces that you've heard or may have been told about by snooty music teachers who perhaps grew up in a, an era when, uh, when this was all out of fashion. Make your own judgments when you can. Whatever our individual music tastes, there is no doubt that these were exciting and fascinating times in the world of church music, as well as music in general. 
Many of the personalities involved led extraordinary lives, which have made for interesting study, hence our recent book, in which Trevor Jarvis, the assistant librarian here at the RSCM, and myself looked into the lives and music of 46 composers born between 1850 and 1870. We didn't include composers like Stainer or Stanford or Sullivan because so much has already been written about them and their legacy. We wanted to know more about one work composers like Maunder and Simper and to explore the forgotten gems written by better known composers like Hugh Blair, Alan Gray, Sir George Martin, George Bennett, together with the editor composers like Johnny West at Novello, Charles Pierce, one of the earliest composers of hymn preludes, and Charles Vincent. Gradually, however, we found ourselves drawn into a more diverse musical world with names such as Sir Richard Runciman Terry, Varley Roberts, Walter, Spinetti, Walter Spinney, and notably from the organ point of view, Edwin H. Lemaire and William Foulkes. Because of the dearth of recordings, I have only been able to play a you a few extracts of choral music, none of which I would admit really sell the idea of a worthwhile legacy. But I promise you that there is much of worth still to be discovered by enterprising choirs and organists. Because of the large number of new works appearing from contemporary composers, which is of course a wonderful thing, the incentive to look back and explore is often not strong and the effort needed to find old scores is onerous. Uh, just as an aside, I actually believe there may be another lost era, and that's the mid 20th century. Composers like Eric I'm sorry, we seem to have lost uh, John in the ether here. Um, so uh, here we had we have one extra piece that he was uh, that we were going to play for you, which we'll do now. And if he comes back, then um, all well and good. Um, but this is uh, this is um, William Fawkes's uh, first sonata. <laughs>
Hello. John, I think we, hello, John. Welcome back. Um, <laughs> I think we lost you for a bit, so uh, I, I've uh, played your final um, your clip. Right. right. May I continue? May I continue? Uh, yeah, I'll just mute myself so you can hopefully get the feedback. Right. Have another go, John. Am I okay now? Try again. Try again, John. Uh, can you hear me now? Excellent. Sorry about that. We don't ever get power cuts to here, but uh, my computer went off. <laughs> um, having explained, yes, where had I got to? Uh, our book, uh, which you will in a moment see a, 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 a visual of the, that's slide five, please. Sorry, uh, we, yeah. sorry, John, we are getting, still getting a lot of... Um, uh, our book contains a mixed media CD, which includes printable copies of over 200 choral and organ scores. On inserting the CD into a computer, uh, this menu that you see here um, appears, giving access to all the scores and to work lists compiled for each composer. More importantly, there is over four hours of organ music performed by American organist David Lamb from New Jersey. He was organist of All Saints Cathedral in Albany, New York until retirement. And David has a particular ear for detail in this kind of music and is completely at one with it. Uh, I was going to announce the William Folk Sonata, but I gather you've just heard it. <laughs> so I, I think I think I'll end there and uh, ask for any questions. <laughs> okay, John. Thanks very much indeed. Um, actually, before that happens, uh, I'm now going to um, ping us over to Derbyshire from some words from uh, the director of the RSCM. Uh, uh, Hugh Morris. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm just wearing these headphones to make sure that we uh, reduce the amount of that audio feedback in case it was coming from anywhere here. So I hope you've enjoyed that lecture today. Uh, it's certainly a fascinating window into a world that uh, perhaps some of us don't know as much about as we might. Tim mentioned earlier at the start about how the RCM has done so much of innovation in 2020. And of course, that's because there's so much to do and to be done. These lectures form a part of that. And if you're able to show your appreciation of the lectures and of the lecturer by giving us a donation, we'd really appreciate that thank you gesture. Of course, uh, if it was a, an in-person event, you probably would use cash to do that. Although that seems to be something in short supply. Indeed, I was struggling to find the, the money this morning to send in with my daughter to school who had a Christmas jumper day. We, we couldn't find enough pound coins because we seem to have no need for pound coins at the moment. But of course you can text and you'll see the codes there at the bottom of your um, screen to, to be able to donate us some money and we appreciate everything you can give. Uh, you can donate five pounds or you can increase that amount anything up to 20 pounds. Or if you head to our website, rscm.org.uk, if you click on the donate button at the top, you can open and it opens onto an easy way that you can either make a single donation or set up a regular donation or even apply to be an individual member as which tim was alluding to earlier where you can get a special discount on it so uh, i do hope you'll feel able to um show your appreciation to john for all his work on this uh and uh thank you both to tim and to john for powering through the technological gaps there and hopefully by the time i pass back to tim that they're um, able to carry on the conversation and to unpack a few of the interesting uh, avenues that John has, has, has laid out before us. So thanks very much, Tim. Done that again. Thank you, Hugh. 
so do please show your appreciation for this lecture, if you can, by texting or going online to make a donation. And if you'd like to use our membership offer, this week's code is L59 F for Freddy G 9 Z 2. And that code will expire at 5pm uh, next Thursday and it's down uh, below um, for the moment. Uh, and finally, before we move on to the questions, uh, next week's lecture will be delivered by Professor William Rennick, who will be talking about a day in the life of Salisbury Cathedral circa 1500. Um, you may know that uh, New Serum, as it was called at uh, some time, uh, was the center of uh, a big, a big center of liturgical uh, um, understanding before the Reformation. So that should be very interesting. Now to some questions, John. Uh, let me get you in, back in. Hopefully, I think we're still having problems with your microphone, John. Is that better? Uh, no, it's not. No. Nope. Uh, let me see if there's anything I can do this end. I don't. Let's just put in echo cancellation. Um, How about that? I think there's still a little bit of echo in there. Um, first question Musical forces change over the years, John, um, as does the liturgy, as you have alluded to. Um, in your investigations, have you found any music uh, for choirs that, that uh, would be suitable for today's choirs that are maybe limited with, you know, limited for men? Um, you know, maybe just one line for men or, or that sort of thing. No, there's there's very there's very little uh, in that era that didn't include men, and usually two parts at least. Uh, there was also great use of soloists. It would seem that. Very many choirs had soprano, tenor, and bass soloists, and an awful lot of these anthems do have solos in them. <clears throat> but I didn't, I'm not sure I can be heard, but. Uh, hmm. I don't think I can be heard. Uh, what's the balance between accompanied and a cappella music for choirs of the period you've covered? 90% 90 was accompanied, very little a cappella. I'm having troubles. Yeah. Uh, why the land without music comment when so many homes had piano? Pianos, sorry. The comment is entirely false. <laughs> Um, I think the person who made that comment was really referring to the sort of mainstream orchestral side of things. But if they had seen how many choirs uh, there were in almost every town and village of the land, you couldn't possibly say that this was a land without music. Another one from John. Uh, could you comment on the musical influences on Victorian composers, please? Maunder Stainer and Simper were much denigrated by my teachers. Uh, the interest and performance of their music didn't just stop. It, it carried largely on until the First World War. Uh, and then, of course, um, just like with the Second World War, uh, most of the men in the church choirs disappeared off to war. Uh, and so a lot of this music couldn't be performed. Uh, I'm not saying that there was then suddenly uh, an increase in music for upper voices, uh, like there was in the Second World War, uh, but there seemed to be a natural death uh, of, uh, of, of their music round about, uh, round about the First World War. <clears throat> I, it's of interest to note that in 1961, uh, Novello obviously thought there was going to be a, a Maunder re revival because they republished a vast number of his works and all the cantatas in 1961. But I suspect that this wasn't a good business venture. <laughs> yes, I'd be surprised if it was. Um, nowadays, uh, thank you. 
Nowadays, we're thankfully blessed with some wonderful women composers contributing to our church music. Were there really no women, at, women, women composers at all involved in church music in Victorian times? Um, as soon as our book was published, I had complaints that there were no women in it. Um, uh, but actually, there were only a handful of published church organ composers in that 30-year window that we took from 1840 to 1870. And so little was known about any of them uh, that there wasn't enough to, to write an article. I mean, Dame Ethel Smythe could have been included, uh, but much is already written uh, about her. And she wasn't really a church-orientated composer. And we just basically couldn't write about people who didn't exist. Fair enough. Uh, one from Hugh here. Apart, of course, from your own book, uh, where would you direct people to delve further into this largely forgotten world? John, sorry, we can't hear you. John. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. <laughs> um, uh, where were we? Uh, 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 where would you direct people to delve further into this largely yeah. forgotten world? Um, these composers didn't feature in the musical history books written basically after the Second World War. So uh, people who are of my age now never really learnt about them. Uh, and like I said about snooty teachers, uh, a generation grew up just thinking the whole lot was bad without probably having heard very much of it. Um, if you're wanting to find music, then I would always start with the libraries. The British Library catalogue is a, a good start but ordering copies from them is slow and expensive. You also need to know exactly what you're looking for. This is not an option just for browsing. And local libraries rarely have much music uh, at all these days, let alone church music. You can look through a lot of old editions at IMSLP. That's the International Music Scores Library Project. But the choice is rather limited. And you always have to beware, not so much with the Victorian things, but with IMSLP, the data is held in Canada, uh, where the copyright law is only 50 years. So a lot of the music on there is not public domain in the UK, so it's illegal to download it here. Uh, I'm mean, thinking of more modern music, Marcel Dupre, Healy Willen, Poulenc, they're all on IMSLP, but to download them here in Britain is theft. Now, many years ago, the RSCM Library was fortunate to receive a large amount of music from Novello. This was around the time that they sent uh, their entire archives to the British Library, much of which is still not catalogued. I suspect Novello thought that all Victoriana was dead. Um, unfortunately, much of this music is tightly bound in volumes, a bit like this, you know, 100 pieces of music in, a, in one volume, and it makes it quite difficult to scan, but it's not impossible. And I'm always happy to help find specific items, but browsing is more difficult. Uh, probably fi uh, final, well, uh, just a, a plug here, really, uh, that of course, if you, uh, the, the place really to find this music is in your, your splendid book, uh, which is available from the RSCM uh, web shop. Um, and uh, if this has piqued your curiosity, and it would, uh, uh, we have copies in stock now. So, um, do uh, it would make a great Christmas present, I'm sure, for uh, for somebody. Um, I think with the technological issues that we're having today, I think uh, that probably uh, draws us to a close. Uh, thank you very much, John, uh, for sharing your passion for Victorian church music and, of course, giving us your time today. It's been uh, surprisingly, uh, for me, um, fascinating. Um, 
As I mentioned earlier, next week's lecture will focus on a day in the life of Salisbury Cathedral, circa 1500. And if you're able to donate or wish to become a member of the RCM at a discount, the details will remain on the screen for a few minutes. Don't forget the big Christmas carol service tomorrow at 6 p.m. It's going to be really good. Uh, thank you very much for, for watching, and I hope you'll be able to join us again next week for the last RSCM lunchtime lecture of the year. Thank you, one and all.